we all know you for songwriting. We all know you for singing. We all know you for concerts. But very few know that for over 20 years, you've had your hands in film, directing, playwriting, and the likes. Yeah. Uh, tell us a bit about that journey and where we're at now with this series that you're releasing from March the 6th, I believe. March 6th, this Saturday, that's right. Um, it's, uh, I've always been interested in always giving the visual. You know, I've always been interested in telling a story beyond the music. Um, if you, for the, for, the, for the old schools that may be watching this or even the new schools that may want to research this, um, I, would, I was champion, trying to champion um, artists being able to, you know, gospel artists to do music videos from back in the mid eighties, you know, because music videos was strong, you know, MTV was birthed and BET Video Soul was birthed, but they would never spend the money on us to, um, you know, do a music <laughs> video. Uh, and um, uh, if you go back to the commission album, if you go back to uh, On the Winning Side, and you listen to right before perilous times, I do a shootout and we're acting it out in on the record real quick. But I had a taste for it back then. And I started researching it. You know, um, I loved telling stories um, since I was a kid, you know. And uh, even in, when I got graduated from school, I went to, uh, I had a filmmaking class in college and I, I fell in love with, directing and, and everything else from that point, you know, just, wow, this is so interesting. So here we are, we're, we're looking at uh, a, a, a dramatization, a, a virtual play, 6th of May, which thereafter people can enjoy it, but you write and you direct, but also okay. uh, the all the kits that's recorded with that's yours, the production company is... Yep is yours during the lockdown you had at least 30 or 40 people employed film um how have you kept that on the radar because i mean we know bread of life bread of heaven we know glory to glory we didn't know you were rolling like we knew we knew the harley davids we knew the the hot rods but we didn't know this you know i'm not good when it comes one of the blessings of being with a record company for all those years from 1985 to 2017 was that part of, you know, promotions and marketing, I didn't have to ever worry about. It was just plug and play. Here's the song. They tell me where to stand and what to do. And then I turn it on. Uh, now I find that I'm not the greatest marketing person for myself. You know, and like, I, I, I know how to grow a social media page. I got a million followers on Facebook, got 635,000 followers on IG and 500 over here and so many over there and YouTube has this, but I don't always talk about the stuff like this until now. I'm just like, you know, I really need to build this up because I believe one of my greatest gifts uh, is not my singing voice or my musician skills, I believe those are good, but my greatest gift is the anointing to help people. You know, it's easy if, if you call all your good friends at all hits. And, you know, if, I, if I'm like, I'm only working with Kirk and Yolanda and Donnie and Israel, and I'm, you know, I'm helping them, but I'm not really helping them, you know? But it's something when you can call, I have a, 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 a teaching spirit. You know, I have one, I love to see people grow. I love really pouring into folk. And um, I probably could have been a teacher, like just a regular school teacher if I enjoyed school, which I didn't. But <laughs> I, I'm a coach. In real life, I'm a team player and a coach. When I was in the military, I was very leader oriented, even though I didn't want to be a section leader. Um, a squad leader. I just found myself and it rotated to something like that. Um, I've just always had this leadership that wanted to see people, you know, see people 
there people make it. And so I've had my my touch, the Lord have allowed me to touch several people who have made it, not just the people you know, you know, the Marvin Saps, I called him in 19 and taught him the ropes. And now look, Israel Holton was in the audience somewhere, nobody knew his name. And I called him up on stage and I looked at him and said, you got next. And he didn't know what that meant. Um, Joanne Rosario, tons of people, Dawkins and Dawkins, you know, just people that came, sat up under me and I taught them and I, you know, gave them wings. And yeah. I love that. And I'm still doing it now with the, with the, with, with these 40 people I have, you know. And, and that's something I, I was so eager to, to speak to you about, which, uh, I mean, our time is short. I'll see if we can get there. Um, and, and also you will tell us how we can, uh, actually, how can the, the, the online, the virtual play that you have, how can people uh, uh, get to it? And how long is it available for? Well, right now, we're going to keep it up for, uh, if you miss it, Saturday night, like at the time, the first viewing is live. That's so when I, there, when you're watching with us and you're I'm watching. I'm actually watching with you and, and watching the comments and uh, sending comments in and out. And we, you know, just enjoying it with the people. But then after that, when that show is over, it immediately goes to on demand. Now it's gonna, the first show is gonna lock people out. If they don't get in the room by a certain time, even if they got a ticket, it's gonna lock them out. But as soon as that show is over, it goes to on demand. So even if they had a ticket and they couldn't get to it in time, when they, when they get to it, from my understanding, when it starts again, they can watch it anytime at their leisure. It's uh, on demand. And so it'll be up for at least a week to two weeks that I'm thinking now. Uh, and plus, they, I'm going to re-air tickets. Uh, now, the tickets go to my Real Fred H, Real Fred H on Instagram. Real Fred H, follow me. And hit the link in the bio. It'll take you right to where to buy the tickets. Okay. 1999 US. Wow. So let, let me ask you a, a few other things, because there's so much. I mean, it, we don't often get the opportunity to, to speak to you. Um, you talk about your heart for people and whenever you're interviewed historically you always talk about being real uh, you talk about you know your your job is to to speak and be real uh, looking at your life now um, I mean you've you've been in the military you've you've had a record label still have a record label you have a production company but you've also known the pain of a uh, uh, a broken relationship and all those things. Um, what do you, how did your divorce change you? And what do you now say to people who are maybe going through that pain of, of broken relationship? Maybe not a divorce, but just going through, going through the pain of, of the heart. How did divorce change and what do you say to people now? Um, you know, it was one of those things that, um, it, 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 I let it drive me to be better. Okay. Um, I, in, in my instance, my divorce wasn't caused by me just doing crazy stuff. I did crazy stuff in my early part of my marriage, you know, you know, just, and it wasn't like out running around, you know, carousing with other women. It was just, I wasn't a good husband. You know, I, I didn't know how to be a good husband. I didn't, I wasn't responsible with money. And, you know, I had a young wife and I wasn't responsible with money. And I, I, I didn't know how to be. And she comes from a father that she saw a very stand up person in the community, a bishop, a pastor who was very responsible. And I was not as responsible because I come from a broken home of just the mother who never seen a father. I knew how to pay the bills, but I just wasn't good with money. And we, you know, didn't have a lot of it and I spent it wrong. And, and I was arguing about it. I was defensive about it, you know, not being a great guy in my first three to four years of being married, you know, and then it almost died within three, three, four years of my marriage. I just, we weren't taught. There was no fiscal or economic literacy. There was no, I had no, I didn't grow up around anybody with a father. 
I didn't, we didn't have one. I didn't grow up with, to, to know. And um, the first four years, it almost ended. And I was like, mm -mm. I mean, hey, you know, it is what it is. And the Holy Ghost pulled me aside and said, one thing that I can always count on. Sorry, sir. Um, That's all right. That's all right. You're back. Uh, one thing I can always count on is that I'm honest with myself. You know, I had a theory back then, like if you're defensive, lie to your lie to everybody else, but don't lie to yourself. If you're going to lie, if you're going to tell a lie, just go ahead and tell it to everybody else. But don't lie to yourself. The biggest lie is when you lie to yourself. And the Holy Ghost, my my wife left me when I was first four years. And I was just there, there by myself. And I thought, okay, it's over. So what? I'll get somebody else. You know, I'm in commission. You know, there's a lot of women out here. You know, I was very defensive. And the Holy Ghost said, is she right about what she's asking you to do? I said, yes, sir. He said, so are you going to let this in because she's right? I said, no, I'm not. But I, I can't go get her now. You know, I mean, if I say, you know, I'll fix it, then it's just going to just sound like I'm just saying anything to just not let it in. And so I just made changes while I sat there in the house for three weeks by myself. And I just made changes, thought changes, you know? And um, at that point in time, I just made the decision to be, a, be Fred Hammond and not Freddie. And when I became that, that's when I became a man and she ended up coming back. And then the relationship thrived. When it broke apart the first time, the second time I held on as long as I could. And I just made sure that I wasn't in a position to, be the person that somebody can point the finger at to say, well, he's an idiot. He's just kind of, I hung in there as best I could. And I just wasn't strong enough to hold on to something that was pulling away from me, you know? And if she wasn't carousing the street or out with other dudes or nothing like that, but there was a power struggle in the home. And I was only so strong. Two visions, two visions. It, there you go. Once you, the best way when you, if, and I want to speak to everybody out there that's married that might be going through. If you ever find yourself in that position where the struggle is going on, nine times out of 10, it's because you have two visions in the home going on. And two visions is the Latin word to do is die, D I, and then vision, die, vision, in a house divided cannot stand it's the word of god so when you have two visions you have a fractured home the best way to seal that up is to find the one vision and get back on it that's the only thing god will bless mm -hmm. you know that's the only thing god will bless and that's what ended up happening i could not i was saying here's the vision here's the vision but you know a godly woman who felt like she was hearing from god and she couldn't hear from her husband who was hearing from God and we blew it. And um, I just made sure of this, let me say this though, this yeah. is the most important thing. I made sure that after the wreckage, even though I was falling through, walking through all of the pointing of the fingers and the hair salons and the churches saying, oh, what a bad person he is. He not, they're not in our home. They don't know what's going on. I made sure of a couple of things that I never, put the business out there in the street and made her shine in a dark light, no matter what I was facing. People were talking stuff they didn't have no clue about. We're not gonna, I'm not with him, no more. I'm not buying none of his records. He, they don't know it. I said, it is what it is. I didn't protect myself. Then the second, but most important thing was, I made sure they had a safe place to land. And all I said was, you know, I'm gonna love you from a distance. Since I can't love you up close, and you won't let me love you up close, then I'm gonna just be over in the wings and I'm gonna make sure you have whatever you need. And um, we'll just go our separate ways, but I'm gonna love you from a distance. And my kids, they'll always know I'm, I love them. And no matter what, so. 
that's I mean I mean I could we could talk about that for hours because there's so many uh for having followed the story I mean like I said there's there's been times we've been out in Africa uh where you, you you're there with your group and I've, I've been there and, and heard conversations and known uh some of the things you were saying uh because what one of the things that was constant that I heard from you were you always said uh my my ex-wife she's a wonderful woman there was never uh any slighting of her but let me let me move forward since our time is is short um when you you have your your flight time experience your uh jimmy jam and terry lewis moment yep. which was a big turning point for you you're in flight time studios and you come out saying god i i need am i able to do something like this for you um tell yeah. us that moment how that affected you and is that still a part of your 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 headspace now have you moved on from that i'm still there that moment was a turning point in my life i actually went to two studios that day one was jimmy jam and terry lewis from flight time and i was amazed at what number one two young black men could do and they were doing what they wanted to do uh, running their own company, but doing what they wanted, making great music. And I was walking from studio to studio to studio. And we didn't even know you could own your own studio. We weren't, we didn't have any kind of that kind of money. Um, and then <laughs> I went over to Paisley Park and it was like 10 flight times. And we walked in, number one, we walked in speaking in tongues because we thought, you know, the devil gonna get us. <laughs> <laughs> because at that time, Prince was really mysterious and he was doing all this other stuff, but I had to see it. Like I had to see it. And when I walked in, they weren't burning candles. They weren't, you know, nobody was having voodoo or nobody was saying witchcraft. They were just doing business. It was a bunch of people walking around doing business. It was a very creative space. It was colorful. It was, this room is this one. And this is the this room. And this is the white room. And this is Prince's personal room. And this is the warehouse. And to this day, if you look at it between Paisley Park and, and flight time, my operation still looks like that. It still looks like that because it's about the creative space. What they did with it and what I'm doing with it is just two different things, but they're still, you know, I was very glad to see Prince turn his life around and go in a more positive direction towards the end. Uh, but Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis is still a part of my DNA to this day, you know. So, so many of us look at you um, and we, we look at where you're at now. We look at the, the car company, we look at the le record label and, and, and all these things. And, and I, I've heard people up close and personal uh, say to you in press conferences, oh, Fred, I wish, I would, please lay your hands on me so I can be like you, et cetera, et cetera. But you tell a story of a journey where uh, that's full of rejection in your in your in your early days, being yeah. kicked out of groups, uh, uh, wanting to do stuff and people not believing in it, and and you go through all that, uh, uh, and and actually your journey seems to be full of being the first to do things, which means you know yeah, it, it's fraught with with difficulties. For those who are not familiar, who's just family familiar with the uh, the Grammy winning Fred Hammond, what are some of the stories that you could tell, tell to, to encourage people that re rejection is not the end, if, especially if you go back to the early days, what are some of the, the things you heard, the things you were told, the groups you were walked out of that you can tell us? Uh, I remember I was with a, a, organiz a choir organization, a, a, a very popular guy in Detroit and he was on Savoy Records. Um, his name was Donald Vales. And I remember, you know, he was the popular dude. He was a choir guy. He had did some great core lyrics and the voices of deliverance. And, um, and I wanted to be the bass player. I was the bass player of the voices of deliverance. And I remember going to rehearsals and, and everything and, um, uh, and then getting the night of the recording and there's, I walk up and there's another bass player there and that does not even know the material and there are no charts. And I knew the material, but 
I think it was a schism somewhere else and with some politics going on that I had no knowledge of. And I caught the bus all the way from the west side of D Detroit to the east side with my guitar on my back in my hand. And I sat there the whole time watching this bass player. And then they said the record company said it. They wanted another bass player. And when I talked to the executive producer, somehow God put me in the room with the executive producer. And he said, no, I didn't make that decision. He made it. And what do you do then? In your sadness, in your disappointment, in your rejection, what do you do? Well, I didn't go off. I'm not a go off type of person. I will, if I have to fight for my family, but I just was sad. I didn't cry, but I stayed through the whole thing to show my support. And then I got on a bus and I rode it home at 11 o'clock at night. You know, uh, a, a, another one, here's a, here's a very interesting. Nobody knows I was kicked out of the original Tremaine Hawkins band when she went on tour. I was kicked out of that band. I was the bass player. I was, I was playing with the Winans and they were had some downtime. And um, I was gonna go on tour with Tremaine and it was uh, two other musicians and um, a good friend of mine. Uh, he played guitar and he sang higher than I did. So we were gonna be the bass, the lead, the drums. Michael Williams from Commission was the drummer. And uh, there was another young man as head of the band. So when we got there, we had rehearsed and I sang my part. I'm a singer and I, I knew my part. And um, when we got to the audition, the guitar player who was supposed to sing another part sang my part. And he wasn't great at it, but he sang my part. He choked and he froze, but we boys. So I said, okay, I'll just, I'll just sing the top part. I didn't learn it, but, but I'll sing it. And I figured, you know, they, they know I can sing. I'm with the winers, you know, that's cool. And I'll get it. And I looked at the guy and I said, hey, man, you're supposed to sing the top. That's what you've been singing this whole three weeks. He looked at me and said, mm, I sing this part. And he froze. Wow. And so the piano player looked at me and said, mm, mm And instead of getting rid of the guy, they called in Jonathan Dubos to play bass. Wow. And I got kicked out and I was devastated. So much so that I that I, I I talked to a few people and they said, well, Fred feels like he didn't get a good break. And so Jermaine was there and she came and said, okay, baby, let's go, let me hear you. And it was so much pressure. I started singing and playing and I just folded. I, I put my head down. I just shook my head because I didn't remember my part or any other thing. And she said, but baby, this is a business, I'm sorry. You know, maybe there'll be other times, and I I got kicked out. So I listen, this is this is, but this is you uh, at the at the point in your life where you're working with the legendary winers. You're working with Marvin Winers, no less. Who is no, he's not. A, I mean, doesn't suffer fools at all. He only works with what's what's tough and what's working. Yeah, and um, you figure I would get credit. Didn't and see and the thing about it is. In your rejection, you know, when you're doing your best. Now, it's different when if I had rehearsed and did my part and then I want to blame everybody else, don't be that person. But when you're really working hard and you're really trying, uh, and then all of a sudden you don't know that there are other forces at work, not just the devil trying to get you out of the group, but the devil playing or people with mind games or playing tricks that I, I don't want this person that I want. There are all sorts of manipulative things that are going on Sorry. for are certain talking, reasons. Are you talking about you're talking about gospel music? That happens in gospel music. Christians do that. Right. That was the church, gospel, that happens in everything, you know, because we're still people. You know, the beautiful thing about it was I didn't blame any of them. I was hurt. I man, I, I literally, my depressions were different. My, I could function as a depressed person because I was young and I still believed that I'm supposed to be doing something greater, but I'm, that knocked me off my feet.
And I'd love to say that I got the gig back or I went and somebody else heard me and saw me and, and got me and this, it didn't happen for a year. They were going out on tour and on the road and Michael Williams was coming back telling us all about it. And commission wasn't strong yet. Commission wasn't no record deal. We were just rehearsing in the basement. And um, it, you, you had to sit in that desert experience. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So mm -hmm. the definition of patience is the ability to remain the same while you wait. So in my sadness, in my despair, I kept pushing. I was always positive. I didn't want to come across as a hater. I didn't mean mug nobody. I never looked at Tremaine as a, oh, I was upset. I felt treated unfairly, but I never let my heart get black about it. And I believe that's the only reason I'm here today mm -hmm. because there are a lot of people that got rejected early in them days that I grew up. They, you should know who they are. You should know their name because they're amazing talent, but the road they took to bitterness, unforgiveness, and you know, you, you, you pride, you'll never know their name because they weren't able to transit. But I was able to sit in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the embarrassment. Y'all don't understand how embarrassed I was. How did I, who had been traveling with the winers, it was an easy gig for me. And it was going to make a nice amount of money, which I needed at that time. And I'm rejected and embarrassed. The word is going out, Fred lost the gig. Fred lost, oh, he lost the gig. And I had to sit through it. Wow. I had to sit through it, but there we are. Way. That's there right. We. Fred Hammond, thank you so much for, for your time. But just a couple of one, couple of things more I want to ask you. Um, so you talk about that scenario. And I mean, I've, of course, I was jesting when I say you mean Christians do that because some of those storylines you capture in your in your uh, TV series, The Choir, uh, yes. which is, uh, I think you yourself have described it as a mix of Greenleaf meets Power meets um, uh, <laughs> the, the the Lions, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's, it is because that's, see, the story I told you is filled with that. What the choir is going to be about is filled with that. Mm -hmm. um they're behind the scene thing but now I'm, I'm not it's not embarrassing like you nobody would know well, that must be about your main or that must be about the way it's not like that but it is the i believe this now the choir is different from surviving williams surviving williams is a little bit more you know family friendly it's a little bit more bernie mac it's a little bit more this but the choir is the ratchet part of what is going on in the world and that God will walk into the ratchet. God ain't afraid of the ratchet. Only we're afraid to tell the story of the ratchet, but the Bible gives us the clue in the DNA that the way to righteous is through the ratchet as David, as Abraham, but when, ask when, them all. But Fred, when were, you able, when were you able to come to that point? Because for some, they walk through those parts of the Christian world or the gospel music business and it it blackened them it corrupted them and they themselves started I mean you have seen enough pastors and some of the things that go on there for you to be able to tell some some stories for ages but clearly your position is that hasn't blackened you you come to a place where you say you know, God is at work within this. When did you arrive at that? Or were you always like that? And from, I just always had a DNA. You know, I was raised by a great woman who made a mistake, who I would never talk about in a negative way. I'm a mistake. You know, I, I, I'm a mistake. I shouldn't even be here. If my parents were both appropriate in two areas. They would, I wouldn't even be here. If number one, they were married to other people. And number two, my mom had an abortion that did not work. She didn't have a thought and then run out. It They performed it and it didn't work. But so now I'm- out, You found this out just months before your mom passed away. Right, a year wow. before she couldn't. When she told me, six months later, she couldn't talk no more. It was over. She could not talk. She had a stroke. And God allowed her to tell me in a way that 
just unlocked the truth of who she was. But that was my mom. And I loved her. I had a passion for her. I, you know, and I just, I loved her. And now nobody better not talk about it. It's like, and now I realize that there are so many people, there are pharisaical people, and then there are people like Jesus. It's, it's, those are the two. It's either, you're either one or you're the other. And those that stand on the religious rock and say, you know, those are the people that if the woman of the woman that was kept, found in adultery had been before them, she would be stoned so that they can prove themselves to the people around. See, I'm on your side. Whereas Jesus, that was a mark against him when he basically forgave her in front of everybody mm -hmm. and they could not cast it. So, so I've decided if I'm going to follow Jesus, he was radical. That's why I got the name RFC. Radical in my thinking, not radical in my jumping around, you know, and radical in my ability to jump high and do PX90 praise. Radical in how I think. I go where places that people won't go. I'm a Peter-ish type of person. I will get out the boat and I will go where people need me most, even if it doesn't look that great. The good shepherd will lead the 99 go after the one and it ain't always that popular to go after that one now i can't let it influence me and do it period of time it probably could have took me one way or the other i ain't gonna lie and i just made a decision i'm not gonna let this affect me i'm gonna always fight to do the right thing even against my flesh even against everything else so fred hammond you know we could we could, we could talk about that you've got so many stories beyond your 60 years i mean just the story of your your knee replacement alone that's a testimony by itself uh, we haven't even talked about the music the story behind the songs but one final thing i want to ask you just for the record uh, mm -hmm. you recently were very uh magnanimous um in pointing to bishop marvin winans and saying listen my my mentor when your mentor sings your song and you put up a video of him and uh donny and jay moss uh mm. singing, singing one of your songs and that i mean that was a hair raising moment but for yeah. you i know that uh the journey of israel houghton uh, started with you he talks about playing guitars for you i know that marvin sapp he's he's spoken many a times about getting a call from you and and thinking it was a prank and saying no yeah whatever you know um uh, i i know that even bishop john francis here in the uk uh, yeah. he was eager for you to sign him to your label i uh, wanted to so bad what are some of the some of the people that people may not know who are connected to you. And I know you probably feel a little, a little reluctant thinking, nah, I don't want to boast, but you know, just for the record, do a, a, a journey for us and talk about people who are connected to Fred Hammond, uh, who you were part of their, their journey that we may not know. And I, I tell you one of the reasons I ask, there are people, there's a young man who I spoke to just yesterday and someone who I know was a part of his journey. Actually, paid the bill for one of these big concerts. And you know, the, the, the young man had forgotten, forgotten that, but the man was a key part of his journey. So it dawned on me that, wow, uh, the people who set you off on your way are not always remembered because people yeah. just go off into the light. Uh, but I am a big one of telling stories of, and, and narrating the journey. This is where it came from. So are there any that you feel comfortable, if you don't mind, telling us just for the record, so we know that the, uh, uh, the DNA, as it were, we say. Of the people who helped me get there or people I helped to get there? Oh no, people that you helped, people that oh. you helped get to where, where they are. Or people you know, who came out of the journey, came out of, our of the journey. came out of, you know, Fred Hammond's band, came out of, your production companies and where they are? Um, this will be one of them things that when we get off the phone, I say, oh, I should have said so-and-so. And you say, oh, I should have said so-and-so because you don't think about it. Usually after you do it, those people come up to you and say, yo, unk, and you're proud of them. You say, oh man, 
Yeah, I remember when I did ASCAP as Fred Hammond, the BMI awards or the ASCAP awards, and they were honoring Marvin Winans. And I sang Long Time Coming, but now I'm Platinum Fred, I'm this, that, and the other. And I got up and I said, I hope I made you proud. And then I did Long Time Coming and I just saw his face. Like it just came full circle. Like this is what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to help you get where you were going. So if you look at it, the recent Aaron Lindsay, producer Aaron Lindsay, who produced Never Would Have Made It, produced Israel Holden, produced all of these great hits over the last six or seven years. And he's Aaron a out, record exec, record company exec himself. Yeah, and yeah. he came to my, uh, he came up under my camp. You know, I brought him to the studio and we got the studio. I taught him this and I taught him that. Rodney Jerkins will tell you, he came to my studio at 13 years old and he wanted to be a rapper. And we immediately, I was working on the very first Dawkins and Dawkins album. And um, Rodney Jerkins at 13 years old walks in with his brother, Freddie, and they come through and they're talking. And I asked him, what do you want to be? He said, I want to be a rapper. And I said, well, well let's go jump on that track. And he went in there and did this track. I don't remember the song, Tribes and Perfect, Huge Person, Losing Their Beliefs and Their Beliefs, they to do. And he went in there and slayed it. And then, you know, we just, every time we see him, we just, he said, I'm going to be a producer one day, Unc. Watch, 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 watch. And he recently came to me and said, Unc, I dissected all of your stuff. Like King of Glory blows my mind. It blows my mind. I dissected. Do you know I use a lot of that stuff? You got yeah, Trump. This is Rodney Rodney Jerkins that went on to do Michael Jackson. He went on to do. I mean, at, at a point, Rodney Jerkins was was costing half a million half a million dollars to to produce. I know because I was working in a record company, and some of our artists were being sent to record Rodney Jerkins. Yeah, and so Rodney, you have that one, and that's a he and I talk to this day. I'll go over his house when I'm in LA. We sit down and talk about this and that. He's one of my favorite people. Um, Christine Bell, I'm not sure if you guys are all familiar with Christina Bell. Christina Bell, I took her out on tour with me, Donnie, um, uh, Charles Jenkins and Ch James Fortune. And I did a play inside of the music, inside of, a, I did a musical called The Festival of Praise. And uh, I took her out on the road. And she was a part of this group called Zyel way back in the day. And, but she had a look and I wanted her to play a role. And she, she didn't know if she was gonna do it because she didn't know if she could travel. She worked it out and she went out on the tour with me for the Festival of Praise. Now people know her as Twinkie in the Clark Sisters movie. You know, and what she just told, she said, I'll put me out on this one. And like I said, a lot of people I'll forget even when I'm watching their success that I'm connected to them because I don't watch it from, look, I did that. Look, I did, look at me. I, 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 I don't do it. I don't look at it like that. I had to even remember, somebody said, remember, she was out. Yeah, Christina did. You think that helped her get this part? I, I, I wouldn't think so. She's just, you know. So it's so many people and there are people that are not stars that are not on the record. Monica Coates, now the head of Motown Gospel. She was my assistant for six years, seven years, you know, making 350 a week as my assistant, you know, and she was an amazing person that got me on track, kept me on track. She was always diligent. Well, now she's the head of Motown Gospel. Just you in, know? The last, in the last year or so, she was, she was, uh, uh, put in place when she last year or two, a couple of years, a couple of years. Yeah. But she had been with Verity and she had gotten jobs that, you know, based, she was able to grow after me, but she cut her teeth with me. You know, um, I just did a Zoom with her and she just really recanted a lot of the things. Uh, very proud of her. Kevin Wilson, good friend, my best friend. He uh, was with me forever. He came in as a intern. He didn't even get paid for a year. He just wanted to come and sit under the room and now he runs a major mega ministry in Charlotte, the park, and he's the head of media over that whole thing. Kenyon, Pam Kenyon, can you help me? You know, she has gone on to do things. Now she's down with her, with her husband, Bishop Cortez Bond, and they're part of a ministry in Florida. And the list goes on because when you come through, 
if you listen, the Holy Ghost will talk to you through me. It won't always be what you want to hear. But when you get finished, if you stay the whole operation, if you stay and get the whole haircut, it'll look good. A lot of people's problem is they have an agenda and they want you to, they want you to do how they want you to do it. So it's like this. It's like getting a haircut. That first initial, if you stop saying, uh -uh, I'm getting out of here, you're going to look stupid. But wow. if you let that barber finish everything, when he's finished and he pop that towel, it's that first cut, though. And same thing with a surgery. You know, the first initial incision, incision hey, doctor, you stabbing me in my chest. And rip your chest open. If you get up off that table or try to, you're going to die. Let the process happen. And those that have done that have gone on to do great things. Fred Hammond, thank you so much for speaking to us. Just one final time, just remind us, of the, uh, the, the Williams family, uh, when it is, how people can get tickets, and uh, uh, yeah. Please, fam, yeah, I'm building again. I don't want to be building. I'm building yet another mountain to climb, but I love the passion of it. I talked to Devon Franklin yesterday. You know Devon Franklin? Yeah, absolutely. Keeper, keeper, uh, Hollywood agent, man, pastor, lover of God, but he's very connected. He took out 40 minutes to Zoom me and talk about my project and what to do. And he said something most profound. He said to me, Fred, don't lose the passion. Even if the business side ain't there and the next and execs ain't there, don't lose the passion for creating. He said, I hear it in your voice. I see it. You're, you're editing. You, he looked at me and said, you're editing? I said, yeah. I mean, I don't have a big staff now. It's got to be me. He said, so you direct, you write, and you have to edit. Man, I got to do it all. And he said, so how do you feel about that? I said, man, I got to be honest with you. I love it. It's like, I, it's, it's a passion. I just need, it, I need the money side to catch up with you now because I'm 60, so I, I ain't got that long mountain. But he said, don't lose the passion. And I, I agree. I do love it. I, I edit in the middle of the night. I'm glad I caught you because I went to bed around 7 after being up from about three in the morning to seven and I'm gone, you know, and I happen to reach up and say, oh my God, I gotta catch my call. So um, Surviving Williams, Surviving Williams family, go to my page, go ahead and follow me if you're not, at Real Fred H on Instagram, at Real Fred H on Instagram. And my fan page is Fred Hammond fan page, um, but I do most of my connecting through Instagram. That's where you're gonna see most of it, at Real Fred H hit the bio in the link. It'll take you right to the tickets. It's this Saturday. It's going down. It may be a little late in where you guys are, but you can watch it in the morning or the next afternoon. It's on demand. But those of you that do want to stay up, because I'll be in the first chat room. I see people from London. It's two o'clock in the morning. And they're like, Fred, Fred, London here. Fred, Fred. And we're just going back and forth. So real Fred H, go to the page, hit the link, and it's on and popping. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Premier Gospel. Premier Gospel.